nice to see everyone. Um, my name is Miss Brittany. I let me share my screen. Okay, so my name is Miss Brittany. I'm going to share a little bit about myself. I may have seen you last month, um, but for those of you that are new, I love animals. I have a handful of pets, including two cats, two very beautiful cats. I have two dogs as well, a miniature dachshund and a husky, very high energy, fun, loving pets. I also have two children. My son, Remington, is two and a half. Here's two pictures of him. And my daughter, Camilla, is now six months old. In addition to my normal pets, I also have a hobby of keeping some exotic animals in my home, or more likely um, in the backyard. So two of the exotic animals that I have are called marmosets. And they are these tiny little monkeys. The biggest they get is about 12 inches long. So they stand about this tall and they have cute little faces that make fun expressions. The other animals I have is a ring-tailed lemur. If you have ever seen the movie Madagascar. And then I have a kinkajou, which is native to Brazil and South America. They're very nocturnal. So they sleep during the day and they are out at night looking for food. They love bananas. These two live together and these two live together. Okay, looks like I have a hello from Leo. Hello, Leo. The other thing I wanted to talk about is where I'm located. So I'm in the United States and I'm located in Florida, which is a little state that sticks out down in the Southeast of the United States. And I'm located in the very south of Florida. So we stay warm pretty much all year. And when it gets cold, it doesn't ever get cold enough to snow. So if I could have you type in the chat message, where is everybody from? Oh, here, I'm going back to the chat message. So I see Yolanda. No pets, that's okay, but animals are a lot of fun. Lisa, hello to everyone. Leo, we have China, yes, Grace, Beijing. Yolanda says Canada, okay. Annie, Leo's Beijing, Lisa, Shanghai. Excellent, so it seems like we have some students here from all over, welcome. All right. We have oh, William is Shanghai. So today, if you were here for my um, web, webinar last week or last month, we talked about habitats and we focused really on adaptations of animals in those habitats and why they adapt. Um, so we're going to kind of veer off into that how and why animals adapt in today's lesson. So let's go ahead and get over to our book. So here's our book for today. It's How and Why Do Animals Adapt by Bobby Kalman. And if you see this adorable little animal on the front, this is called a fennec fox. And they are very cute little animals that live in the desert. And we will be looking more into what a fennec fox is. Before we get into reading the book, I wanted to look at a video talking about adaptation. So that way we can refresh our memory for those of us who were in class last month and those of us who were not, um, we'll have a little bit of background information. Okay, here we go. I'm Dr. Jeff Vinegar, and today we're gonna explore the science of adaptations and the environment. <laughs> In the world of science, an adaptation is a characteristic of a living thing that helps it survive in its environment. So a hummingbird's beak helps it survive. How? 
The hummingbird beak, which is long and skinny, allows it to reach deep inside flowers. Once it's in there, it can drink nectar by curling up its special tongue like a spoon. Whoa, Dr. Jeff, there's so many different types of birds with different types of beaks. Are all of those adaptations too? They sure are. Let's break it down. Birds have all different kinds of beaks based on their environment and the kind of food they eat. Like finches, who use their small beaks to eat tiny seeds. Pelicans, who use their large, pouch-like beaks to scoop up fish. Or hawks, who have sharp, hooked beaks to eat small animals like mice or lizards. But adaptations aren't just limited to birds, are they? Nope. All kinds of animals have adaptations. I think we should go check some more out. It's time for a... Hey kids, you want to watch this? Okay, so in that video, they talked about a handful of adaptations in birds. Um, specifically, they were talking about what we call a physical adaptation. So last month, we talked about the difference between a physical adaptation and a behavioral adaptation. So a physical adaptation would be something about the animal's physical body that has changed over millions of years that help it survive in its environment. Brett, let's see, Brandon says, wow, yes, that was an interesting video. And those are amazing adaptations. So again, those were all our physical adaptations. The other side of the coin is behavioral. So they change how they behave in order to help them survive in their environment. Okay. Hold on one second and I will get us back to our book. Oh, here we go. Okay, so we talked about animal or adaptations being a living thing um, a characteristic of that living thing, helping it to survive. We also talked about how that characteristic could either be part of its body or its physical appearance, or it could be a behavior, how it behaves or acts in order to help it survive. So those are the two different types of adaptations. Now there's different reasons why animals may adapt. And we're going to focus on three main reasons why animals might adapt. The first reason an animal might adapt is to adapt to their environment. So adaptation is all about survival. When the environment changes dramatically, some animals die. Other animals might choose to move to a different location, but there are some animals that over generations will develop an adaptation that helps it to survive. Let's see, we've got two more in the chat. Yes, very cool, Dylan. Okay, the second reason an animal might adapt is to protect itself. So many different animals have adaptations that protect itself from predators. Some adaptations are behavioral, which allow them to act a certain way to avoid being seen. Um, an example of that is the sloth. If you've ever heard of a sloth, they're very slow moving creatures that hang upside down in the rainforest and they climb very, very slow. The backs of sloths are covered in algae, which also helps them to be camouflaged or not be seen up in the trees. The third reason an animal might adapt is to obtain or get food. And this is the one that we saw in the video. So the hummingbird, its beak is an adaptation that allows it to get the nectar out of flowers. So this is talking about how hummingbirds have long skinny beaks that help them drink the nectar deep inside the flower. And that is a special adaptation. Plenty of other birds have adaptations specifically to where they live and what they eat as well, like the pelicans we saw and the hawks. Now, this is a good example of some other physical adaptations with the giraffe. 
And giraffes have quite a few adaptations that help them survive in their habitat. So one of the things they have is the very long neck that we've seen. And that long neck is going to allow them to reach the leaves up in the tall trees. And then they also have this long tongue that can wrap around the leaves and get all of them off. Yes, yeah, so I see Darwin's rule of evolution. So when Darwin was talking about was natural selection. A lot of people refer it to it as the survival of the fittest. And that means that the animals that have these characteristics that help them survive are going to survive and reproduce. So that's going to make more and more and more of them over generations continue to get that adaptation. Okay, so our book, How and Why Do Animals Adapt? This is a fun little creature called an eye eye. Okay, why do animals adapt? Sometimes when there are big changes in an animal's life, the animal has to change to stay alive. Changing to suit a new habitat is called an adaptation. Animals adapt to find food, survive hot or cold temperatures, and escape danger. So that's what, those were the three things we were talking about. To find food, to adapt to their environment, so that would be the hot, cold temperatures, among other things, and to escape danger. So mainly looking at predators. The animals that adapt easily are the ones that have the best chance of staying alive. So this right here is a penguin, and this is going to be a great example of how this animal has adapted. So most penguins live in icy cold areas, but the yellow-eyed penguins make their nest in forests near ocean shores in New Zealand. They have adapted to living in a much warmer habitat. So rather than living in the icy cold Arctic, these penguins are in a tropical area. Old and new adaptations. Many animal adaptations have happened over hundreds or even millions of years. So adaptations do not happen overnight. Some may happen a little more quickly. Adaptations can happen in the body or in the way the animal behaves. And we talked about that. We said it's either in the body or how it behaves. Can you remember what those two types of adaptations are? Type in the chat box if you remember what they were. The two different ways animals can adapt. We're saying in the way they behave or in their body. Let's see if anybody remembers that. I see, yes, Lisa, physical and behavioral. Physical is in the body and behavior is how they act. Excellent. Lisa also has a question. Does elephant's long nose count as a kind of adaptation? Absolutely, yes. That is a great adaptation for an elephant. They are such large animals. So they use their nose to get water to bring it to their small mouth. Otherwise they would have a very difficult time to drink. Um, so that's a great example. Good job, Lisa. You're welcome. Okay, so here is another great example of an adaptation. It says the Arctic fox lives in a very cold part of earth which is covered in ice and snow. It has thick white fur and tiny little ears. The small ears keep the heat inside the body of the fox. So this specific fox has tiny little ears so that way heat cannot escape out of its ears. So take a look at this fox, okay, with the tiny little ears. Now look at this fox. If the Arctic fox has small little ears, to keep the heat in, why do you think the fennec fox would have these very large ears? Let's see in the chat. Why would a fennec fox have large ears? Okay, Lisa says to keep the heat out, to hear better. Yes, both of those are exact, excellent answers. 
So these large ears actually help the fennec fox to cool off and then they work to hear very, very well. Good answers. Oh, we skipped one. Up here is a koi wolf pup. And this koi wolf pup lives in a city park. They are part coyote and part wolf. So they are hybrid. Their bodies and ways of life have changed to surviving, uh, living near people. All right, so another way that animals might adapt is they can change the, how they move. So changing the ways they move has helped some animals get from place to place faster. Birds and bats are made of the biggest adaptations when their bodies change so they could fly. Other animals have adapted their ways of moving to suit new habitats or keep themselves safe. So this is our example of a bat. It says bats are the only mammals that fly. Many years ago, they were small animals that lived in trees. Their bodies changed so they could find more food. Their long fingers now support their wings. So that's very important because we know, well, there's plenty of birds that fly, but only one kind of mammal. So it being a mammal means it has fur, it gives birth to live young, um, it nurses live young. So this is very, very big adaptation and I'd like to explore that a little further. Let's watch this video on bats. of an animal it's small and furry it can be pretty cute and it flies around at night can you guess what animal it is that's right i'm thinking about bats some people think bats are scary maybe because they only come out at night or maybe because sometimes they live in dark places or maybe it's because some species of bats called vampire bats survive by drinking blood. But you probably won't ever run into a vampire bat. Only three species of bat are blood drinkers. The rest of them, over 1,200 species, eat fruit, nectar, bugs, and other small animals. If you ask us, bats are totally awesome. Here are just three of our favorite things about them. To start, some bats can hear their way in the dark. That's because they don't rely on their eyes like we do. Instead, bats use sound to find their way around. Have you ever yelled into a big empty room or a canyon and heard your own voice shout back at you? That's called an echo. The sound of your voice moves across the room to the walls and then bounces back to your ears. As a bat flies through the night, it does something really similar. It makes a sound and then carefully listens for the echo. And the way the echo comes back can tell the bat a lot about what's around it. This special skill is called echolocation. If the echo comes back quickly, that means there must be something pretty close to it because the sound only travels a short way before bouncing back. But if the echo takes a long time to bounce back, then the bat knows that the object is further away. Bats can tell not only how far away something is, but also how big it is and how fast it's moving, all from using echolocation. And since bats are constantly using echolocation to figure out the world around them, you'll often see them flying around with their mouths open to keep making sounds to bounce back. Another thing we like about bats, they really like to hang out. Bats hang upside down in quiet, dark, hidden places like the roof of a cave or the underside of a bridge. But how? When I hang upside down from the monkey bars, after a while, I start to feel like my head is going to explode. Bats can hang for a long time because their bodies are built for life upside down. The little pathways in their bodies that blood moves through called arteries have special valves in them that only let blood through one way. As the bat's heart beats, the blood has to keep moving through its body in just one direction. That keeps the blood from getting stuck in the bat's head when it's hanging upside down. That's a pretty neat trick. But you know another thing that's easy to like about bats? They make really great moms. Bats usually have one baby called a pup in a year. At the beginning of that pup's life, it clings to its mother's belly all the time while the mom wraps her wings around it. Maybe we should stop calling good snuggles bear hugs and start calling them bat hugs. And thousands of moms and their pups can live together in a huge group called a nursery. 
Even when it's cold outside, the nursery stays warm because of all those bats hanging close together. Plus, when mom needs to go out and find food, she can just drop her baby off at the nursery with all the other moms and pups. When she comes back, you might think it'd be hard to find her baby again. I mean, there are thousands of pups that look just like hers. But bats and their pups can recognize each other through their smells and their voices. So when a pup calls out, the mom can fly right to it. It would be like trying to find your family in the middle of a crowded amusement park, except all of the other kids at the park are calling out for their parents too. So what do you think? Aren't bats scary cool? They have super sensing abilities. They can hang out upside down and they're marvelous moms. Do you? All right. So they talked about a couple different adaptations in this video and she focused on, um, I definitely saw one physical adaptation and a couple different behavioral adaptations. What were some of the adaptations that you saw from that video? Go ahead and type in our chat box. Oops. Oh, hold on just one moment. Let me get my chat box. There we go. Okay, so Lisa says their echoes. That is an adaptation, the echo location. So this would be a behavioral adaptation that they let out those sounds and then they come back. And I would even go as far as saying a physical adaptation that allows them to interpret or understand that echo location. So that is a great adaptation. There was another adaptation that she talked about that allowed them to hang upside down. Does anybody remember what that was? If we could type in the chat box. Yes, Yolanda, their blood. So the blood traveling in that one direction through their body and then having those special valves that only go one way, allow them to not get too much blood in their head when they hang upside down. That is definitely an adaptation. Lisa, claws as well though. They will need those claws in order to hang. If they don't have those, they cannot hang upside down. So excellent job. There's another animal that has changed the way it moves, which is a dolphin. So its flippers are made up of fingers like ours um, under its skin and that's what allows it to swim. In addition to that physical adaptation, dolphins also use echolocation. Dolphin, yeah, yes, those are my favorite animals as well. So they use echolocation just like bats do to tell where things are and to hunt. All right, how about these kangaroos? So another way of changing how they move is the tree kangaroo. So most kangaroos that we know hop on the ground, um, but one kind of kangaroo climbs trees and lives up in the branches. Tree kangaroos have adapted to living in trees because the forests grew in their habitat and they could find more food up in the trees. So looking at the difference between these two types of kangaroos, we're seeing very um, clear physical adaptations. So they have some claws, unlike the hands on our other kangaroo, they've got long front legs and short back legs, which is a difference from the regular kangaroo. And they also have this very long tail and this kangaroo has a shorter tail and they do serve different functions. So the bodies of tree kangaroos cause them to be clumsy on the ground, but allow them to climb trees easily. Tree kangaroos have claws and pads on their feet for gripping tree bark, a long tail for balancing, and short back legs, uh, shorter back legs than the kangaroo that hop shown on the left. The short back legs are better for climbing. Okay, here's that fennec fox that we were looking at before. So another way animals adapt or another reason, this is to adapt to the habitat or the environment. 
um, adapting to deserts, they have to adapt very specifically to these very hot climates during the day with very little water. And then deserts get very cold at night, so they need to be able to handle that as well. The deserts are dry places with very little rain. Few plants grow in deserts because they are so dry. So animals that live there must adapt in order to find enough food and water to stay alive. Camels, for example, store fat in humps on their backs. The fat provides them with energy when they cannot find food or water. Some animals live in burrows or holes to stay out of the sun. So here is our fennec fox that lives in a burrow. It says the body of the fennec fox has ad adapted to its hot, dry desert home. Its long ears allow heat to escape from its body and to hear prey moving underground. The fox gets water from the food it eats. To hide from the hot sun, the fox spends most of its day in an underground burrow it has dug in the sand. So we're seeing a handful of physical and, um, and behavioral adaptations there. Next is the camel. So camels are suited to desert habitats in which they live. They have one or two humps that are filled with fat. When they cannot find water for a long time, their body breaks down the fat into food energy. Camels have also adapted to keep water from leaving their bodies. They very rarely sweat. And this is saying the colors of the fennec fox and camel blend in with their sandy habitat. How does blending in keep these animals safe? Anyone wants to type in, how do you think blending in might help keep them safe? Ah, oh, William, I see sonar location. Yes, the echo location, excellent. So the question again, how does blending in so they cannot be seen? So that would be the any predators might have a harder time seeing them when they blend in. Excellent. Okay, now winter adaptations on the other side of that. So we had desert habitat. Um, habitats that have adaptations for the very hot climate. And now we're looking at winter adaptations, adaptations that help them to survive in a colder climate. So some animals live in cold places for all or part of the year. Body adaptations and changes in behavior keep them warm in freezing cold temperatures. The snow leopard has adapted to winter in its Rocky Mountain home. So the leopard's thick fur keeps it warm. It has a long tail that helps it to balance. Its big chest helps it breathe in the thin air high up in the mountains. And the leopard's big paws help it walk and climb in the snow. So their paws serve like snowshoes so they don't sink into the snow. A bear sleeps during much of the winter and wakes up on warmer days to stretch or snack on its stored food. So we call this hibernating. Let's see, I have a video on some winter adaptations. I'm just going to get through this ad. Here we go. One of the best parts of winter is curling up with a blanket and a cup of hot cocoa, watching the snow fall outside while you stay nice and warm. But what do animals do when it gets cold? They don't have blankets, hot cocoa, or heated houses like we do. Well, different animals have different ways of dealing with the winter weather. Some animals migrate or move to a warmer place for the winter. And some of them hibernate or hang out in their cozy dens underground. They don't come out until it's warm again. But other animals don't migrate or <coughs> hibernate, and they manage to live in places with really cold winters. But how do they do it? Well, they've come up with a pretty cool way to fit in with their snowy environment. I'll give you a hint. It involves a winter coat. Not a jacket with buttons or a zipper like you or I might wear. 
Instead, they have fur and feathers that cover their bodies when it gets cold. When the days get shorter, these animals shed their brown or gray colors and grow white fur or feathers to help them make it through the winter. Let's meet some of these color-changing animals and find out how their special coverings help them survive the chilly season. First up is the Arctic fox. The Arctic fox gets its name from where it lives, in the Arctic. The Arctic is located at the most northern part of the world, around the North Pole. Arctic foxes live on the land and sea ice where they hunt birds and other small animals. But they don't always look the same from season to season. When the days get shorter and colder, their coats get thicker and whiter. This is what an Arctic fox looks like in the spring. And this is what it looks like in the winter with its winter coat. The most important thing about the fox's winter coat is that it keeps the animal warm. With its extra thick fur coat and bushy tail to wrap around its body, the Arctic fox is better at holding onto its body heat than nearly any other Arctic animal. But their fur does more than just give them warmth. Their white coat also camouflages them or helps them blend in with their surroundings. Blending in with the snow lets the foxes sneak up on their prey, like Arctic hares and small birds, and it also helps them hide from bigger animals that might want to sneak up on them. But when the seasons change, so do their coats. In the summer, Arctic foxes shed their white coats and grow new ones that are brown or gray to blend in with their surroundings after the snow is gone. Now things can get tricky for the Arctic fox because one of the animals that it likes to eat, the Arctic hare, uses some of the same tricks to survive the winter. Arctic hares also live, you guessed it, in the Arctic, mostly in forests. And like the foxes, they have thick white coats of fur to keep them warm, plus pads of thick hair on the bottoms of their feet. Now some Arctic hares live further south where there's less snow. So they actually grow darker coats that help them blend in in those environments where there are more rocks and plants than there is snow. No matter where they live though, Arctic hares like to keep their fur clean. So they groom themselves like cats do by licking their fur. The cleaner their fur is, the warmer it keeps them. Our last animal with a winter coat doesn't have fur at all. It's a bird called a ptarmigan. The ptarmigan lives in the Arctic too and can often be found hiding in bushes or behind rocks to avoid predators. They have feathers that change from brown in the summer to white in the winter to help camouflage them from bigger animals. Their soft, fluffy feathers are pressed close to their skin, trapping in their body heat and keeping the birds toasty warm in the snow. They also have extra feathers on their legs and feet to help keep them warm. And ptarmigans have other ways of staying warm in the winter too. Sometimes they'll fly straight into a pocket of powdery snow. This makes a little burrow or tunnel in the snow that they can snuggle up in. Kind of like the fort. Whether it's an extra thick coat to help keep them warm or white fur and feathers to keep them out of sight. When it comes to living in winter, these Arctic animals have it covered. Thanks for learning about them with us. And remember... Okay. Okay, so what were some of the adaptations that you saw in that video? We saw a couple different adaptations. We saw some physical and some behavioral adaptations that allowed these animals to survive in the very cold climates. And anybody remember what one adaptation was? Yes, Arctic foxes grow white fur. That is very important for them. So they change color with the seasons and they also get that thicker coat that helps them to stay warm. All right, I'll give you a couple more seconds. We've got the Arctic bunnies. Yes, the Arctic hare that does the same thing that the Arctic fox does. So that's a predator that's doing this and now prey um, that's doing the same thing. So it's changing the color of its coat as well as the thickness. So it's able to camouflage and stay warm. Excellent. And Leo says the bird, the bird does something very similar, changes the color of its feathers and then the amount of the feathers to keep warm. Good. Okay, so another adaptation that we're looking at is leaving their habitats. We call this migrating. So going from colder temperatures to warmer temperatures. And many different animals do this. 
Very good. All right, so if one of the animals or types of animals that you can think of that migrate are usually birds. So many animals migrate or move to other habitats to escape cold weather, find food and water, or have babies. Many kinds of birds, such as Canada geese and Arctic terns, migrate to warmer places for the winter. So Arctic terns migrate the farthest they fly from the North Pole to the South Pole and back again. That's a very far trip. Yolanda geese. Yes, the geese are very neat animals. So not just birds are ones that migrate. We also see animals like humpback whales migrate from cold oceans to warm oceans to give birth to their calves or babies. Another animal in the ocean that migrates is the great white shark. So I live in that tiny little peninsula at the bottom of the United States. The great white sharks migrate all the way down the coast and we end up seeing a lot of them right along our coast when it gets cold up north. So we don't really like to go swimming when there's too many great white sharks in our waters. Yes. Yolanda says some fish do as well. Excellent. Okay, some animals lose their homes because people cut down forests or build farms where the animals once lived. So this is an example of a baby elephant that has gone under an electric fence. So they're trying to migrate, but unfortunately their path has been blocked by humans. So this mother is not able to get under the electric fence, but the baby is. That definitely is going to pose a problem for these animals while they're trying to migrate. All right, so our next one is a behavioral adaptation. And this one is the decision to live in groups. So one of the most important adaptations animals have made is living in groups. Animals that belong to families or communities can help one another find food and keep safe. Examples of animal groups are monkey troops, lion prides, dolphin pods, and meerkat mobs. So a meerkat lives in mobs of 20 to 30 members, and we call that mob as their family. They live in large underground homes. Groups of meerkats guard their homes and watch for predators while others look for food. Working together helps these animals keep alive. And they, these animals live in the desert, so they need many different adaptations to help them survive in their habitat. Okay, up here we see these monkeys. So this is groups of Japanese macaque monkeys, also called snow monkeys, keep warm in pools that are heated by nature. The monkeys groom or keep one another clean as a way of being friendly. I have a good video on this one. I find these animals very interesting. HB. Give it just a second. Okay. In the far north of Japan's main island, Honshu, Japanese macaques have discovered a unique way of surviving the icy winters. Most primates live in warm, tropical or subtropical climates. But these macaques are adapted to living in the cold. Not surprisingly, they're also known as snow monkeys. Winter in the Japanese Alps is harsh and snow covers the ground for a third of the year. Food is hard to find often hidden deep beneath the thick layers of ice and snow. 
The snow monkeys have extremely thick coats with a soft downy underlayer. This protects them against temperatures as low as minus 15 degrees Celsius. At this time of year, they have to make do with a meager diet of bark and pine leaves. They need to keep eating as much as they can to fuel their bodies in these sub-zero temperatures. The snow monkeys of Jigo Kudani, or Hell's Valley, have become renowned worldwide, and scientists have studied their behavior for many years. Their habit of visiting the hot springs here was started by one female back in 1963. Quickly, others followed suit, and the trait was passed on from one generation to the next. Now, this is a famous and firmly established winter activity for snow monkeys in this part of the country. Volcanic springs heat these waters to a comfortable 40 degrees, and the macaques spend hours in the hot tub, grooming and socializing. Such extended baths strengthen the bonds among the group members. Snow monkeys are the most northerly living primates apart from man. Being clever enough to make use of hot springs has made their cold existence much more bearable. Okay. So they have a couple physical adaptations as well as one very big behavioral adaptation that allows them to survive in that cold habitat. So in addition to living in groups, what was that other behavioral adaptation that we saw? Anyone wanna type in there? What was the other behavioral adaptation we saw? for these snow monkeys. I'll give you a few more seconds. Ah, oh, there we go, yes. Bathing in the hot springs and they eat as much as they can to get enough calories to survive. Very good. All right. So the great pretenders these are adaptations of how these animals look. Some animals have developed coloring or patterns on their bodies that help them blend in with their habitats. This is called camouflage. Camouflage helps them hide from predators or prey. Many animals use mimicry and mimicry makes the animal look like plants or other animals, making it hard to tell what they are. So this here is a praying mantis. And that praying mantis is a small insect. They have many different kinds. Some look very scary like this one. And then others mimic flowers like this one. So this one's mimicking a flower. Some mimic leaves or branches. And this one says it's a leaf insect that looks and moves like the leaves on which they live. They are hidden by camouflage and can rock back and forth to mimic the leaf being blown in the wind. If I were to walk by this, I would not notice there was an animal or an insect there. Let's see, Lisa has, owls are also good at this, at eating as much as they can. Yes, those are great adaptations. All right, so new kinds of animals. The bodies of some animals have changed so much that it is hard to believe they are part of the animal groups to which they belong. 
mud skippers, which are these fish here, tree shrews, and eye eyes are just a few examples. So mud skippers are fish that can live on land as well as in water. They can walk, skip, leap, dig, and swim. They can even climb trees. These fish can breathe through their mouths and their skin. Very interesting animals. So unlike other lemurs, so I showed you a picture of the lemur that I have as a pet, a ring-tailed lemur, eye eyes have developed teeth like rodents for chewing and a long middle finger for pulling bugs out of trees. Their long toes allow them to hang from branches. And then a tree shrew looks like squirrels, but have bigger brains inside their bodies. They are more like primates, such as monkeys. Very interesting. Okay, so we've now seen plenty of different types of adaptations to different habitats, um, but all of these habitats that we looked at were different habitats in nature. We haven't really talked about how do animals adapt to the fact that humans live all over the world and take a lot of the habitats from these animals. So there are some animals that specifically adapt to city life or to living around humans. So many animals must live in cities when cities take up the land that was once their habitat. Some animals adapt easily to city life and live longer because they can find more food there. City animals include squirrels, foxes, coyotes, koi wolves, raccoons, possums, and skunks. Tell me, what are some animals that you see in your city? So we see some dogs, cats, yes, some mice. Excellent, some foxes. And all of those different animals have adapted specifically to live and survive near humans. Raccoons, yes, we see plenty of raccoons. Lisa, birds, there are many birds. Geese, Yolanda, excellent. Okay, so let's read about these down here, Leo, a dog, good. A lot of squirrels, yes, squirrels do very good. So we have here, squirrels find food they need in trees and people's backyards. Ah, oh, we see some monkeys, Lisa says, I wish. I wish we had monkeys here where I live. That would be so cool. Okay, we have the red foxes are omnivores that can find plenty of animals to hunt in the city, such as squirrels, rats, and mice. They also eat plant foods. Skunks often live under people's decks or garages. They dig up grass looking for grubs to eat. You do not want to come in contact with the skunk. If they spray you, it's very stinky. Uh, the koi wolf, which is part coyote and part wolf. It's bigger than a coyote and lives much longer than both animals. Koi wolf is one of the most adaptable animals on earth and it lives in many cities, including Toronto and New York City. Oh, there's two leases here. Okay, I did not notice that, but thank you. Uh, yes, we see sometimes blue jays. I see blue jays around my house often. Mice. Very good. All right, we are at the 10 minute mark. So I think we were going to see if we wanted to open up the chat to see if there were any questions. Let's see, does anybody have any questions for me? I'll give it a few more seconds for anyone that's thinking questions that they may have. Oh, Brandon, good question. So Brandon says, why did we lose tails? 
well, they didn't really serve a purpose for us. So we, over many, many generations, millions and millions of years, animals, if there's certain um, appendages that don't necessarily serve a purpose or don't help that animal survive, that may end up being um, evolved out. So in our case, we don't have a tail anymore, but we still have a tailbone that shows you know, that that structure was once possible. Good question. Does giraffe have, looks like a blue tongue. It does appear as though their tongue is a bit blue, but I don't know that that is a specific adaptation as just a variation. So for example, like our tongues are pink. Doesn't necessarily do anything good for us. So an adaptation would have to help it to survive in order for it to be an adaptation. Um, and then a variation would just be something that happens in nature. Their tongue being very long, on the other hand, is an adaptation because it helps it to survive. Does a snow monkey feel hot when they're in the hot tub? Um, I would imagine that they feel nice and warm. Um, the fact that it's nice and cool outside, if they get too warm, they could get out and get back in. I don't know if you've ever done a hot tub in the winter, but it's a similar situation. You get too hot in the hot tub, you can get out where it's cool, but I would imagine the hot water makes them feel nice and cozy and gives them a little bit of a break from being so cold all the time. The only thing I wonder is how is it drying off? So drying off might be a little bit chilly. Good questions. We have any more questions? I see like a kiwi. Could you expand on that a little bit, Mickey? Oh, yes, it does not have wings. So that wasn't something that it ended up needing. Kind of like the um, penguins, they technically have wings, but they serve more as flippers. Yes, these are structures that just didn't really serve purpose. So they did not... Um, which I believe next month, if I do a webinar, we'll focus some on natural selection and evolution. But over time, it didn't serve a purpose of helping the animal to survive. So it ends up getting, um, it ends up getting evolved out. Okay, it looks like we have just a little more time. So I did have a brain pop video on camouflage. I'm not certain if we're going to have enough time. Let's see, we'll go back to, we'll skip that video. We'll go back to a couple of the videos that I wanted to make sure that I had enough time for. So I'll say one more time, does anyone have any other questions before we watch a few other videos? Okay, we've got no. All right, so I had a video on a fennec fox. That was that cute little fox with the very big ears in the desert. I wanted to make sure we had enough time to finish our book, but I will go ahead and pull that video up. So I found it very interesting. One of the best parts of winter is mm. curl Poco nope. watching the snow fall outside while you stay nice and warm. But that was the wrong one. I apologize. It was supposed to be this one. Here we go. Have a look at those ears. They are phenomenal. Completely oversized. Don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of all foxes, but those ears really are extra special. Hello, how are you doing? You can see as he's standing there, the ears are constantly rotating, twitching, just drinking up every single sound. He's showing off his specialist skill. The fennec foxes are 
incredibly sweet looking, but they're also a very efficient hunter. And those ears are the tools of their trade. Fennec foxes live out in the shifting sands of the Sahara. In miles of open desert, finding anything to eat can be difficult. A game of hide and seek. But Fennex have two unfair advantages. Those huge ears act like amplifiers. They gather all the sound and channel it towards the inner ear. Their hearing is so pain sharp, you can hear things that I can't hear. And it's said that they can hear a mouse's heartbeat underneath the sand. <laughs> Quite incredible. All right, excellent. Now I've seen two questions from either, I'm sorry, Ivan. So why is the water hot in that the snow macaques? That's a great question. Um, that is from what we call geothermal vents. So it's near a volcano and you know how the earth for volcanoes have that hot lava so that has the heat is escaping from inside earth out to the surface. So in these areas, these are little pockets of water located in these um, areas that are going to be heated up during that geothermal activity. So it's causing that water to heat up. We actually have some locations in the United States like that as well. Um, Yellowstone National Park is one of those that has a lot of what we call hot springs. And then Ivan also said, why do we not have fur? So we do have hair. If you notice, you have hair on your arms, you have hair on your legs, um, but we don't have fur like other animals because as we learned other um, ways of keeping warm, that became a little less important at, to our survival. So over millions and millions of years, it's something that um, just didn't necessarily continue for our survival. Excellent questions. Okay, let's get out of this here. All right, well, we had some very great questions. I'm happy I was able to show you that Fennec Fox video as well, especially since we talked about that in the beginning of the book, how those Fennec Foxes have the very large ears and those ears serving purposes um, as far as to help them stay cool in the very hot climate and to help them hear and find food, which is very important when you don't have very a lot of food in your location or habitat. Okay, so it is eight. I'm going to stop sharing at the moment. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for visiting and sharing this time with me. I had a great time learning with you. I will see everyone next time. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.